everyone. Welcome. Welcome to putting on the mind of Christ. Welcome Global Wide. You are loved with an everlasting love. And this is your pastor Yeti. Today I'm going to talk about the problem of good and evil. And in my understanding, I think a lot of people, global wide, will find it very interesting. Maybe already some of a bunch of people, of millions of people already know the difference as we're going to unfold good and evil. And for some, it will be a clarification and a positive coming to them and a relief. So, one of the realizations we receive when we put on the mind of Christ is that sin does not exist. Now bear with me, okay? Once we find out that who we really are, namely God, as we went there, sin just as St. Paul preached is no more. Just as was the case with the Pharisees of Jesus' time, the vast majority of Christians today believe that the way to the kingdom of heaven is to do good and avoid evil. This is a spiritual mistake. This misunderstanding is precisely the wide road of following the law that Jesus warned us was a dead end. Citing the scriptures particularly Genesis, account of the fall, and the letters of St. Paul, we see that seeking psychological wholeness is the way into the kingdom, the way within that Jesus pointed out. The problem of good and evil, or the problem of sin, presents a second major obstacle to the Christian trying to follow Jesus' path into the kingdom. Most of us have been thought that the way to Jesus' kingdom is to spend our lives trying to do good and avoid evil. In society and politics, we have been thought to foster goodness and defeat evil. Unfortunately, as far as entrance into the kingdom is concerned, all this is a red herring. Most of us spend our whole lives following this red herring, the white path of adherence to the law, and thereby miss the narrow path within that Jesus said, was the only one leading to the kingdom. Matthew seven, thirteen and 14. The Pharisees, the popular Jewish teachers of Jesus' time, thought that adherence the law of Moses, the moral ritual and purity laws of the Jewish religion, was the way to the kingdom of heaven. Jesus disagreed. And he spent half his ministry arguing with the Pharisees on this point. Jesus did not urge people to disobey either the civil or religious laws. He told people to do as the Pharisees said, Matthew 23, verse 3. And he advised rendering to Caesar what was Caesar's, Matthew 22, verse 21. But he constantly emphasized that following the law was not the way to the kingdom of his father. 
Jesus said that the kingdom was within ourselves. By his teaching and parables, and above all by his cross and resurrection, he tried to show us the way to this inner kingdom. The psychological wholeness that we call Christ consciousness. Jesus stressed that all the law are fulfilled if we come to the place in consciousness, the Christ consciousness, where we will be at least able to love God and our neighbor and ourselves, and where we are psychologically capable of loving each other the way Jesus loved us. John 13, 34. The extent of our ability to love preached Jesus is the sole yardstick by which God measures our spiritual progress. Matthew 25 verses 31 to 46 and I encourage you to write those scriptures down and read them and pray over them that the Holy Spirit will be giving you an eye opener. Jesus' kingdom is not of this world, but the law is very much of this world. Humanly manufactured and humanly flawed. In the end, only love matters and, as Jesus said, only those who know how to love have been born again into the Christ consciousness will enter the kingdom. John 3 Verse 5. Jesus taught us not to throw the first stone, John 8, verse 7, to make the moral judgment of calling anyone a sinner. For Jesus' sin, in the moral sense of an offense against God, did not exist. Jesus knew that God never judges, just as the father of the prodigal son did not judge. And he knew that nothing we could ever think, say, do, or omit could ever make God any happier or unhappier. God is never pleased or displeased. God, pure love, is about all that, even as he was being killed by those he had come to help. Jesus refused to judge his killers as sinners. Father, Forgive them, for they know not what they do, he prayed. He saw them as ignorant, but not sinful. But didn't Jesus talk about sin, telling the woman caught in adultery to sin no more, John 8, 11, and saying, He who is without sin cast the first stone. Here the problem is historical and translational. Jesus did not use the word sin in the moral theological sense. Jesus was a Jewish teacher speaking in Aramaic. The word Jesus used for sin did not mean what we mean by sin or intrinsically moral evil today. The Aramaic word means simply to err. E-R-R, to miss the mark, to make a mistake, that is, to act in ignorance of our true good. Jesus, as in the case of the woman caught in adultery, recognized such ignorance when he saw it. But as the incident itself shows, he never passed moral judgment on such sinners, mistaken ones. Similarly, when Jesus told us to pray, deliver us from evil, Matthew 6, 13, the word he act actually used in Aramaic means error, ignorance, or illusion, not evil in the morally defined sense. 
Later, because the first Christians found what Jesus thought about the law and morality hard to grasp. St. Paul, a former Pharisee and man of the law, spent much of his letters trying to explain that we are not saved by following the law, but by putting on the mind that was in Jesus Christ, the Christ consciousness. To give two examples, he wrote to the Romans, no man is put right in God's sight by obeying the law. Romans 3 verse 20. And to the Galatians, if a man is put right with God through the law, it means Christ died for nothing. Galatians 2 21. St. Paul even went so far as to say that the only purpose of the law is to allow and enable people to label themselves and others as sinners. Roman 3 verse 20. St. James, who also had the Christ consciousness and for whom, therefore, sin did not exist, preached what he called the perfect law of liberty. James 1.25 And St. John wrote, Whoever is a child of God does not sin, because God's very nature is in him. And because God is his father, he cannot sin. 1 John 3 verse 9. Later, St. Augustine said, we should love God and then do whatever we want. As we move on, in the former broadcast of Putting the Mind of Christ, I cited the testimony of St. John of the Cross who, when he came into Christ consciousness, realized that for him sin was no more. The contemporary Vietnamese spiritual master, Su Ma Ching Hai, whose background is both Roman Catholic and Buddhist, was recently asked if people are sinners. She replied that, yes, people are sinners, because they believe themselves to be so. Just like you, will see yourself as muddy if you imagine yourself to be playing in a mud pile. Once you are enlightened, find out who you really are. Sin no longer has any relevance for you. Similarly, the contemporary Greek Orthodox mystic Spiros Sati, called Daskalos or teacher, is reported by University of Maine sociologist Karikos C. Marquides to have thought as follows. Daskalos emphasized that there is no sin. There is only experience. All human souls will grow spiritually until the attainment of theosis or the realization that one is an integral part of God or the Absolute. We are here in this world to grow in awareness by means of individual and collective experience. We don't condemn children saying they've committed a sin and offended God when they fall as they learn to walk or when they babble as they learn to speak. Or when, they first, or when the first grader makes his letters backwards. Wouldn't it be more Christ-like to afford to effort to adults, including ourselves, the same understanding and compassion as we learn the extremely difficult and complex soul lessons of the physical plane? And perhaps compassion and understanding are especially needed when either we or other have the courage, and it often takes a good deal of courage to make individual experiential choices that are contrary to the law or the prevailing ethical consensus. Jesus himself never condemned anyone. He had compassion for others both in big things and small. 
St. Paul warned the first Christians not to become slaves to the law all over again. Galatians 5 verse 1. But often we have done just that. Over the centuries, the various Christian denominations have replaced the law of Moses by a host of moral laws. Shouldn'ts and should nots. And sectarian regulations. For today's Christians, sin gets in power from these Christians' laws just as in the Jewish religion of St. Paul's days. Sin got its power from the law of Moses. 1 Corinthians 15, 56. What St. Paul wrote, however, applies to these Christian laws every bit as much as the law of Moses cried. Of Moses. Christ, the putting on of Christ's consciousness, redeems us from Christian laws too. Galatians 3, verse 13. When we come into Christ consciousness, we realize that there is no such thing as sin. Our space-time world is made up of positive and negative polarities, but neither of these polarities are evil. There are matter and antimatter, positive and negative, electrical charges, health and disease, love and fear, pain and pleasure, up and down, in and out, hot and cold, black and white, and thousands of other polarities. Negative emotions, by definition, are negative, but like all the other negative poles of creation, they also serve a purpose and have their own truth or else God would have left them out of creation. Every physical substance has positive and negative components, as does every human choice. People often learn as much or more from negative experiences as from positive ones, both positive and negative. Natural polarities, as they are, are equally necessary for the world of space-time to function as the womb of awareness for the sentient beings who live there. Lawrence Richardson writes, in order for the physical universe to exist, there must be polarity. There must be a positive and negative aspect to it. This creates vibration and the vibration allows the physical universe to exist, there could be no dream of divine consciousness, life with all that is involved in it, without it. Evil is a term that we use from the viewpoint of infinity, everything exists without any judgment about what it is. God spells out these lessons clearly in Genesis. On the first day, God made light and its opposite, darkness, a polarity. And together these days and night formed one day, Genesis 1 verses 1 to 5. On the second day, God divided the blue water above the sky from the blue waters below the sea, also a polarity, and together they made one firmament. On the third day, God divided the land from the sea, a polarity, and they made one planetary surface, and it was good. On the fourth day, God divided living from non-living things. This polarity was also called good and made a whole. Also on the fourth day, God creates another polarity, the sun rule, the day and moon to rule the night. Together they make a oneness that was found to be good. 
Genesis 1, 14 to 19. On the fifth day, another two polarities were created, fish and fold, and creeping and walking land animals. This was found good. Genesis 1, 20 to 23. Finally, on the sixth day, God made a human being to his own image. God made the human being male and female, the last polarity, the two poles of which, in the language of Genesis 1.27, form one whole androgynous image of God, and God found it all good. What you will notice is that every one of these polarities that God created had their goodness, not in their separated poles, but in the fact that, taken and understood together, they made holes. The entirety of space-time and of the dualistic space-time language, we have created the name and described space-time per the instructions God gave to Adam and Eve. Genesis 2 verse 19 is made of polarities. All of these natural polarities, including light and darkness, and positive and negative, make unified wholes. You cannot have a wholeness without both positive and negative wholes. It is this wholeness that God always deems good. But then a fly came into the ointment, a four-tongued dualistic snake, into the garden. Genesis 3, 1 to 13. This snake was a liar and the father of lies. John 8, 44. He induced Adam and Eve to use their dualistic reasoning minds to create still another polarity. This one, an entirely unnatural one, were not found in nature or anywhere else in the creation of totally good wholeness, each made up of a positive and negative pole that God had just finished making. Falling for the snake's seduction, Adam and Eve used their dualistic reasoning minds to create the holy, artificial, synthetic, and false polarity of good versus evil. This, as we all know, is the original sin. The original sin, as described with great accuracy in the third chapter of Genesis, is believing that there is such a thing as sin in the first place, and from this original lie has come so much misery. The contemporary Native American spiritual master, Chokcheri Gale Eagle, who was raised in both the Catholic, Christian, and Native American traditions, was giving the same spiritual realization concerning original sin after he prayed for understanding during four days of fasting, he writes, Adam and Eve were without shame and were told to be fruitful and multiply. Sex is certainly not a sin. Adam and Eve were diligently practicing being fruitful before they eat, ate the fruit of the tree of knowledge. Rather, the tree reveals what is good and what is evil. It is knowledge of right and wrong. If everything was created by the Creator and only He existed, then creation came into being as a manifestation of the Creator's intent. This is the Spirit in all things. The Creator within His creation, if everything is perceived as a manifestation of the Creator and imbued with Spirit, there can be no perception of right or wrong act because everything is within the movements of the Spirit in all things. 
Holy Spirit. In other words, before eating the fruit, humankind could not perceive right from wrong because <coughs> Excuse me. Everything was within the Holy Spirit in all things. And therefore only good could be perceived. When people ate the biblical fruit and could therefore perceive right from wrong, they committed the original sin of removing themselves from the flowing spirit, the Holy Spirit in all things. They discovered isolation and ego, for they suddenly became embarrassed for the first time because they were naked. From the creation of the concept of sin by the dualistic human mind came not only embarrassment, but separation from God, since God, by definition, cannot sin, and separation from the wonderful Garden of Eden and its wholeness. The Garden of Eden, of course, is the kingdom of heaven, but placed by the writer of Genesis into the past, rather as in the New Testament and his book, Into the flu Future. Once the human dualistic mind created the concept of sin, there also followed, as Genesis says, shame and guilt. Genesis 3 verse 7. Fear. Genesis 3 verse 8. Blame and fault. Genesis 3, 12 and 13. Sorrow and remorse. Genesis 3:16. Toil and effort, Genesis 3.19, and the loss of the direct seeing of the one's immortality, Genesis 3 verse 19. In short, all the mental, emotional health that the concept of sin brings with it. What the law of good and evil does is make a man know that he has sinned, Romans 3 verse 20. The law of good and evil brings God's wrath. Previously, when there was no law, there was no disobeying of the law. Romans 4.15 Adam and Eve, as the snake had promised, did create like gods. But they created a nightmare of mental imbalance and consequent emotional and physical disease. Because there unnatural creation had no wholeness. It was left for Christ, the new Adam, along with Mary, the new Eve, to demonstrate how to restore the wholeness. Genesis 3.15 St. Paul's preaching emphasized the realization of freedom from the law and of sin that comes with Christ's consciousness, but he may not have fully realized the schism that separates his own Christ consciousness with its unconditional lovingness and great awareness from the consciousness of the average Christian convert. To his dismay, his preaching had just the short, I mean, the sort of consequences a teacher of the law might expect. His converts in Corinth apparently went wild coming drunk to Holy Communion, engaging in incest, and otherwise having a grandly irresponsible time for themselves. Paul reacted by taking them sternly to ask, but throughout his letters, he never changed the basic thrust of his teaching that the Christ consciousness frees us from what he called the tyranny of the law. Galatians 3, 10-13 Even today, 2,000 years after Jesus and the teaching of St. Paul, most of us, because of false belief programming since early childhood, be a good little boy or girl, or still heavily invested intellectually in our imagined goodness under the law. To the extent we have repressed our own emotions in order to appear good, we also have a heavy 
emotional investment in that goodness. These intellectual and emotional investments makes it very difficult for us to get free of sin by er er eradicating from our consciousness the unnatural distinction between good and evil. They are the principal reason the night of sense of night, of spirit and earlier analogous spiritual passages and depressions are often so confusing and painful. A lot of this pain which all of us already carry deep within us could be alleviated of the good news of the gospel, including freedom from even the concept of sin were preached rather than good and evil under the law. Galatians 3, 10 to 13. For the Christian, sin is finally overcome when each of us becomes psychologically whole. When, by the dark night of the soul, we are baptized with Jesus into his death, Romans 6, verse 3, and afterwards resurrection into the wholeness of the Christ consciousness, having learned to accept the truth contains in our own dark sides, we will see clearly enough, if we cannot see it now, that good and evil or sin in the moral sense is a false polarity created by the human dualistic mind, and that for us is no more. Romans 8 verse 1. Does it not mean that a Christed being is so morally perfect that he or she always chooses good as distinct from evil in an ethically defined sense? Not at all. It means a Christed person in realizing he or she is the immortal divine child of God is done thinking in terms of good and evil or sin in the first place. The rationally constructed polarity of good versus evil dissolves, and with it the entire legacy of the fall of Genesis. Shame, guilt, fear, blame, fault, sorrow, remorse, toil, and effort, and the blindness to one's divine immortality dissolves along with it. That is what St. John means, St. Paul means, when he writes, but now God's way of putting man right with himself has been revealed, and it has nothing to do with the law. Romans 3 verse 21. And Paul also wrote, should we continue to live in sin, so that God's grace will increase? Certainly not. We have died to the concept of sin. How then can we go on living in it? Romans 6, 1 and 2. It is also important to note that moral goodness also dissolves along with moral evil. Goodness is replaced with humility, a simple acceptance of the human condition, positive and negative as it is, and an acceptance that positive and negative polarities are both necessary in space-time to produce the wholeness. That is perhaps one reason why Jesus said, remember this, unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The greatest in the kingdom of heaven is the one who humbles himself and becomes like a child. Matthew 18, 2-4 Children, of course, take life as it is. They cannot noting they know nothing of sin or good and evil until they are programmed into such by well-meaning but spiritually mistaken adults. This does not mean that a person with Christ consciousness like a criminal or defiant child goes about disregarding moral. Denominational, secular or other laws are conventions. The person with Christ 
consciousness, understanding that such laws and conventions are necessary for humans to live in community, will orderly comply. But like Jesus when he defended his disciples for breaking like Jesus, when he defended his disciples for breaking, and unlike the criminal or child whose defiance is actually a negative from the enslavement to the law, the person with Christ consciousness retains a radical freedom to disregard any law or convention that is unjust, silly, arbitrary, contrary to conscious, or otherwise inappropriate to the situation at hand. At the present time, A person with Christ consciousness no longer judges. He or she no longer thinks in terms of good and evil. And looking back, he or she often sees that the use of these judgmental categories was an exercise in egotism. That is, because the use of the term good automatically creates by the law of polarity and opposite evil. If I considered myself good because I attend church, then those who didn't, by definition, were evil. If I thought I was good because I was monogamous or gave money to the poor or obeyed the, lo the tax laws, then those who weren't or didn't were automatically labeled as evil. Everyone uses goodness this way because it's the only way the unnatural polarity of good and evil can be used. There is no drug, lord, or organized crime figure in this world who does not see himself as good and his enemies as the evil ones. After all, they may say, I am supplying goods and service people want, and only the evil Puritans and moralistic busybodies hate me. Hitler is always, as always, is the extreme example. He saw white, gentile, heterosexual, non-communist Aryans without disabilities as good. He happened to be one of them, of course, one of the good guys. This is how it always works. The egotist labels as good whatever he or she happens to be or do or believe. Because these Aryans were seen as the only good humans, all other humans by definition were evil and could be justifiably wiped out. Hitler, by intending to rid the world of those he saw as evil humans and secure it for those he labeled good was as much the idea of the goodness in action as he was the idea of evil in action. In the end, the distinction created by the forked tongued snake in Genesis always results in justifying murder. Does the non-existence of sin mean we can do any, anything we please? Two answers, yes. We can do anything we please, and we have been doing just that since Adam and Eve, including murder, rape, war, cannibalism, and all manner of other horrors. Free will means precisely that. We can indeed do anything we please. We are divine sinless beings here to experience space-time to, to the fullest and to grow in awareness thereby. We are free for experience whatever we like, positive or negative. That is why Jesus said in Revelation 3.15, how I wish you were either hot or cold. We are here to experience and to grow, not to take the safe path of being good little boys and girls. There is a second answer. Since God is all in all, 1 Corinthians 15:28 and everyone 
is divine and is God for their being. Acts 17, 28. Whatever we do to anyone else, we do to God, to Christ, and to ourselves. Matthew 25, 40. There is no other. Whatever we do to the supposed other, therefore necessary comes back to the self. As Jesus said, he that lives by the sword shall die by the sword. Matthew 26, 52. That is why Jesus also warned that we should do unto others what you wish to have done unto you. Matthew 7, 12. St. Paul admonishes that a man will reap what he sows. Galatians 6, 7-8. The Old Testament set forth the spiritual, the same spiritual law, saying that an eye would be paid for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Leviticus 24, 20. Deuteronomy 19, verse 21. Buddhists and Hindus call this spiritual dynamic the law of karma, action and reaction. Spiritual laws, though, they may have different names in different religions, are universal. Christianity has no agreed upon name for this particular spiritual law, except perhaps justice. But it doesn't mean God has suspended its operation with respect to Christians. We have the word of Jesus himself that the law of karma applies and it's just and it is justice if not always swift is sure mercy can override the law of karma and so can love which is what St. Peter meant when he wrote that love covers a multitude of sins 1 Peter 4 verse 8 but though Love and mercy can override justice. They do not negate it. Spiros Sati teaches that there is no sin as such. There is only experience. All human souls will eventually be redeemed through the law of karma. And Gary Zukav says in his beautiful book, The Seat of the Soul, Karma is not a moral dynamic. Morality is a human creation. The universe does not judge. The law of karma serves humanity as an impersonal and universal teacher of responsibilities. The law of love, as Jesus pointed out to the Pharisees, can often be much tougher than whatever current moral codes people have devised for their societies. Jesus gave an example, the case of the Jewish divorce, as it was then legislated, where spiritual principle, he said, demanded more of man than the current religious law, Matthew 5, 31 and 32. He made similar points with respect to the laws on adultery, Matthew 5, 27 and murder, Matthew 5, 21 to 24. In the United States, it is generally legal to abort a fetus during the first two trimesters of pregnancy, but that in no way relieves those involved from any karma they may inc incur for terminating the life plans of another soul. Even a society like our own which is very moralistic and legalistic and which manufactures laws by the thousands every year cannot legislate everything. Under spiritual law, however, we are responsible for everything, everything we think, say, do, and fail to do. Matthew 12, 36, we are gods, John 10, 34, 35. Our inner essence is pure love to the extent we are at one with this inner essence of love. We will think, 
speak and behave accordingly. But someone may say, aren't law and ethics necessary? Yes, of course, they are necessary for people to live harmoniously in community here in space-time and for the operation of any human institution. Religious or secular, but here in space-time are the key words. Laws and ethics are of this world. The kingdom of heaven, however, is not. John 18.36 Our entrance into the kingdom depends only upon inner spiritual and psychological wholeness and, as St. Paul says, that has nothing to do with the law. Romans 3.21 Some spiritual masters like Moses, Muhammad, and Gandhi instituted or promoted ethical reforms. St. Paul, as a practical organizer of churches and as a former man of the law, a Pharisee, in Acts 26, verse 5, and despite his preaching that, in Christ, sin was no more, gave plenty of ethical advice to the early churches. St. Peter did the same. Jesus, however, thought in higher plane. He did not spend his time formulating or teaching a detailed ethical code for the Jewish culture of his time. He concentrated on the essentials business of religion, increasing a person's inner level of awareness, the raising of a person's consciousness. He stressed always the purification of the inner eye so that people could eventually come to see the kingdom in their midst. Matthew 6, 23 to, uh, 22 to 23. It has always been the church tradition that the contents of all the books of the New Testament, including the letters of Paul and Peter, are the relieved word of God. I mean the revealed word of God. This means that they were either written by persons with the Christ consciousness or that they were channeled from the Christ consciousness level of spirit. In the case of Peter and Paul, the former is certainly the case, and the latter may be true on occasion. There is a distinction to be made. However, between the revelation of spiritual principles and the practical application of those principles to the everyday affairs of life in the context of the culture of the first century. When St. Peter or St. Paul apply spiritual principles to such matters as the relationship of slaves to masters, 1 Peter 2, 8 and Colossians 3, 22, or the relationship of wives to husbands, Colossians 3, verse 18, or to the type of headwear appropriately worn to Christian services, 1 Corinthians eleven seven, or to the expression of same sexuality, Romans 1, 27. They are not giving the word of God as engraved in stone. Cultural and personal human limitations, assumptions, and even unexamined prejudices necessarily conditions their words. Christians today have the responsibility to apply the same spiritual principles, but in the context of our present world. We shrink our responsibility if we pass it off to Peter and Paul or any other biblical writer. For the Christian, the proper first principle of ethics is not do good and avoid evil. Rather, the proper first principle is do unto others what you would have done them done unto you. Matthew 7, 12 or love your neighbor as yourself. We need to be careful that we don't misunderstood as we say here, do unto others what you would have them do unto you. The 
the thing is that we need to understand that as a child or an adult there is abuse you cannot do that because it was done to you we are talking about the ethics the ethics code that says it has to be the right thing what is it that we would like done unto us first and foremost we want freedom, the ability to exercise our free will without interference so that we can experience the divinely created realm of space-time to the fullness, both ethics at the personal level and politics as the social level, should has as their purposes the maximizations of personal freedom within the context of community and relationships exactly how these principles are expressed in a particular society will vary enormously one key factor being the general level of consciousness in that society keeping in mind that the spiritual laws of love and karma apply at all levels people and societies at the different levels of consciousness see the world differently in general the lower our consciousness the closer the matter the more we define what is ethnically positive or negative by materialistic measurements for example in terms of physical behaviors or in terms of obedience to defined rules and roles the higher our level of awareness the more we define what is ethically positive and negative in terms of such qualities as purity of intention and degree of love. Jesus did not condemn the prostitute who anointed his feet because her heart was pure. Matthew 5 verse 8 And because she had, perhaps even by means of her experience as a prostitute, learned to love much. Luke 7 47 on the other hand he wasn't impressed by the worthies whom his society and religion honored as good because he knew he knew their hearts were full of judgments separatism pride and self-serving even in their prayers and almsgiving Luke 18 9 verse 14 I am not exposing ethical relativism. As the last paragraph implies, the values of people and societies at the high levels of consciousness generally contain more awareness, caring, existential, appropriateness, and tolerance or non judgmentalness, that is, the affording of maximum personal freedoms in the context of community to self and others the values of contemporary liberal democracy or are generally superior to those of medieval Christendom just as the values of a rational level humanitarian atheist or secular humanist are generally spiritually superior to those of the aggressive mythic level Christian moral crusader Another mistake we have made, and Christians are not alone here, is to try to equate negativity with evil and positivity with good. In the first place, there is often no consensus, except by the arbitrary rule of law or custom, as to what pole is positive and what pole negative. To one person, eating broccoli, paying taxes, or practicing polygamy, may be negative. Another person might think them positive. The same torrent of rain may be positive for the farmer and negative for the couple holding an outdoor wedding. And so it goes. Many Christians, including St. Paul, as a creature of his society, once accepted slavery as a positive thing or at least as an unexamined neutral given. Medieval Christianity 
and Islam saw lending money at interest as a major negative. Christianity, but not Islam, no longer sees it that way. Two prime examples of this approach in the history of Christianity have been the equating of Eve and therefore all women with the negative St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas being the most influential proponents of this view and the association of the Africans and others of dark skin color with the negative. Today some Christians are applying the same logic to persons of same sex expression but equating negative poles with evil and positive poles with goodness supply does not work. Instead, it tends to create, as in these examples, create personal and social, societal imbalance, injustice, suffering, persecution, tyranny, and even warfare. In the extreme, it always ends up justifying murder. Why did St. Augustine and St. Thomas and Christianity in January following them equated women with the negative and by extensions persons of same sex sexual orientations, particularly males, putting aside St. Augustine's well-known personal and philosophical hang-ups regarding sexuality. I believe it was because in terms of human consciousness development, the mental or rational level had not yet been clearly differentiated from the emotional, biological human identity, therefore. Had not yet clearly descended the emotional, biological. Women methodologically are associated with both the biological and the emotional, the lower part of human nature in the judgment of those such as Augustine and Thomas. It was for women, therefore the biological, emotional, that the rational mind, the male, had to be freed in order for human identity to ascend to the rational level. This shift of human identity from identification with the biological emotional to identification with the rational mind has been the principal spiritual task of the last 2000 years. Augustine, Thomas and many other Christians played important roles in helping human consciousness make this transition a task substantially completed in the advantaged countries only in the last couple hundred years. As Wilbur says, it was only when reason was fully differentiated from the biological emotional and when human identity had transcended the biological emotional that women's liberation began. With Mary Wollstonecraft in the early 18th century. That is because the purely rational worldview stripped of medic, biological and emotional confusion sees men and women as equal. It should be, and we know it's not equal. In the process of this transition, the rational consciousness, however, Western society, as so often happens, in individual consciousness developed was not content to differentiate the reason from the body and emotions. It went much farther. It made a god of reason and judge reason, the male superior. Society, including the church, then used reason to suppress the biological, the emotional, the sexual, and the feminine. The result was a patriarchal system of oppressing as well as the exploitation of Mother Earth by reasons, technologies, civilian and military. With respect to Christian spirituality, I believe it is no accident that the modern apparitions of Jesus' mother Mary, beginning in the first half of the 19th century, 
and increasing in number every day, even today, have been roughly contemporaneous with the rise of women's liberation. The apparitions are one indication that the spiritual balance between the male and female principles must now be restored. If humans as a whole are the progress beyond reason into the physic and other higher levels of consciousness, the restoration of the feminine spiritual principle, God as women, in shorthand, is essential. Mary appearances reflect the importance God places on such a rebalancing. Finally, it is useful to point out that during the astrological age of Thesis, the last 2,000 years, patriarchal, anti-sexual, anti-emotional, anti-earth-thinking has not been limited to the West. Eastern traditions such as the Hindu were also caught up in the planetary transition to rational consciousness. Paramahansa Yogananda, who died in Los Angeles in 1953, made the following astonishing assertion. To hold man to earth life, Satan creates sex. Satan no less. On the same page, he interp interprets the fruit of Genesis to be sex. And a footnote explains that man expresses more the aspect of reason with feeling hidden. Women or woman expresses more the aspects of feeling with reason less predominant. In the end, no matter how hard we try, we will never have a perfect ethical or moral code. It is an impossibility in this world of polarity and choices. We can never be justified or saved by adherence to the law, including moral law. If we take law too seriously, we can be enslaved. Law is inherently dualistic. Its very essence is to draw a distinction between to approved and disapproved, to seek salvation in the law by doing good and avoiding evil is to entrap oneself forever in dualism and to forbade Jesus' kingdom. Love is not and never will be an ethic, though one form of its expression may be charity or compassion. Love is a way of being it is precisely a particular level of consciousness, one that transcends positive and negative, making of the two duality, one wholeness. Love is the psychological wholeness of the Christ consciousness. Love is the Christ, Christ is God, and God is love. Where you find one, Christ, God, or love, Son, Father, or Spirit, you find all three and anyone with the Christ consciousness is one in essence with all three. God, our souls and persons at the level of Christ and non-dual consciousness, whether incarnated or discarnated, have great compassion for us and for the painful situations we create for ourselves. They are, however, very detached forever and sincerely above it all. They know we can learn from we can learn love and awareness through both positive experiences and negative experiences. And all of us, to be honest, do it both ways. How we do it, positively or negatively, is up to us. In the end, all human experience on this wonderful planet, no matter how negative or painful, will be fully and completely redeemed. That's Guaranteed. Oops, I'm not going to say much anymore. But I think it clarifies a lot. A lot where people were struggle. Lift under a very heavy guilt. May this help you. And take it with you for life. So I will stop here. I wish you all a very good weekend.
I hope a little bit more better weather, even if it's snow, it could be very cold. Or whatever you're going to do in this weekend, may it be a blessing. May God be with you and protect you. And may his light shine upon you. This is your Pastor Yeti. Bye-bye. Enjoy your weekend.